Welcome, everybody. My name is Mina Jane, and I'm the director of the Ashland Public Library in Massachusetts. I'm really thrilled to be here with Daniel and Warshawski, who's going to be talking about his book, um, Food Waste, Food Insecurity, and the Globalization of Food Banks, because we all know what an important topic that is, and we all need to learn. So we're really looking forward to this conversation and um, the conversation the Q&A that we will have after uh, Dan's presentation. So, but before we get started, I wanna say a couple things. One is I'd like to thank the friends of the Ashland Public Library for supporting all of our programming. We couldn't do it without them. I'd also like to thank Dan for allowing us to partner with other libraries to make this, um, this conversation happen. I personally think when libraries work together, it, we make magic. So we did, we have 30 libraries that partnered with us on this because so many know that this is something that um, they're, their um, patrons would really enjoy and learn from. So thank you, Dan, for that. Um, you can buy signed books from Dan um, from Aesop's Fable, our favorite indie bookstore. I will put a link uh, to them in the chat. And um, once Dan starts his presentation, I'm going to turn the chat off for um, for everyone. And then when I we come back to the q and I'll turn it back on. But if you have questions for Dan, please put them in the Q&A. There's a button at the bottom of your screen. So I'm just going to say one thing about Dan. His, <laughs> he is the Associate Professor in the School of so Social Sciences and International Studies at Wright State University in Ohio. He um, actually teaches geography and public administration. So I'll be really curious as, as to how you came around to this topic of food waste and food banks, Dan. Welcome. I'm so glad you're here. Great. Thanks, Mina, so much for the introduction and for the opportunity to speak uh, to everyone today. I'm really excited to talk about my book and have this, this bigger conversation. Before I begin, I want to thank Mina for, you know, having me today and um, the Ashton Library and the whole network of libraries, as well as Aesop's um fable bookstore for um having my uh book available so thanks very much for that um so yeah my my topic is on food banks and um it's a topic that uh, a lot of folks are interested in it's a topic that um i was telling mina just before we started i didn't think i would be you know studying uh looking at this many years later um you know, I'm currently, um, as Mina said, uh, a faculty member in the School of Social uh, and International Studies at Wright State University, which is in Dayton, Ohio. I live in Cincinnati. Um, I do teach in geography and uh, direct the Masters of Public Administration program. So people are always interested, like, well, how did you get around to, to studying food banks? And the story that I'm going to tell um, is that, you know, it was something that I thought would just be... Um, you know, in a short-term job. I actually um, graduated, uh, you know, about 20-ish years ago of my undergrad at the University of Illinois, and I was looking for work. And I found a job looking at um, gaps in, in food bank network in East Central Illinois, the East, Eastern Illinois Food Bank. And that was uh, one of my first jobs after I graduated. And then um, from there, um, continued to study food banks in the U.S. Um, at Wisconsin-Madison. I was looking really in Chicago food banks at that time. And then as I made my way westward to California, I said, finally, I will be moving on to other topics. But of course, that's when I stumbled across the Global Food Banking Network, um, which is a spinoff organization of Feeding America and really had taken a lot of this kind of food banking work to the global south and much of the rest of the world. And so that's kind of why I'm here today has been tracking food banks that continue to expand. And I'm excited to talk to you about um, this work. So as it says here, you know, my my the title of the book and the title of the talk tonight is Food Waste, Food Insecurity and the Globalization of Food Banks. And what I want to kind of contextualize a little bit about this work, yes, I'm interested in food banks, I've worked in food banks, but, you know, I kind of see myself, you know, as a geographer, as a person who studies cities. And so um, one of the big sort of questions that I've been looking at um, processes is urbanization um, and the challenge to build livable cities. You know, we hear a lot about this. Um, so food is one of these basic uh, issues of livability, but we're also thinking about transportation. Um, we're thinking about housing. We're thinking about water, sanitation, energy, and there's many others as well. 
And so within that, um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about the 21st century being the urban century, the century more people are moving to cities from rural areas. And related to that really is the urbanization of poverty um, and um, the challenge to build sustainable, healthy, and socially just cities. But within that, and this is a picture here in, in Johannesburg um, that I, I um, you know, during my field work many years ago, I didn't take the photo, but it sort of signifies a lot of the challenges around um, around building livable cities, a, a constant kind of, you know, uh, tension point is um, what institutions are going to make cities livable? That's one of my big questions that I've been kind of grappling with. Is it the role of government? Is it the role of private sector? And that could be the informal sector or more formal uh, uh, institutions, or is it NGOs? In addition, uh, at what scale um, can we, should we be thinking about these questions of livability, global, national, metro, or community? So a lot of people want to make change in their community, but the question is what kind of institutions and at what scale should we make these changes? So some big, big questions here. And as I said, you know, a lot of this really is, uh, you know, that I look at, I, I've chosen to look at, at food systems. One of the key governance challenges of the 21st century, I already mentioned this whole theme of urbanization of poverty. People in government and communities, I often hear that, well, food insecurity is a rural issue. It's not really something that's a problem in, in cities. And that's not true. Urban food insecurity is a big issue. Food insecurity in cities is different from rural areas and needs, it needs a lot of attention. So within that sort of broader framework, as I said, what I've been looking at is this map. You know, I'm a geographer, I love maps the spread, the development of food banks across the world. Food banks are now in six continents, over 100 countries and a number of different networks. This is a map we're gonna come back to many times in the talk today. And I'm really looking at two basic questions. How and why have food banks developed across the globe? And then what are the impacts of food banks in the world's regions? And to do this, kind of going to divide the talk today really into three parts. First, I want to tell you a little bit about the process of this globalization of food banking that's occurring, particularly through two case studies in South Africa and India, then looking at food banks in the COVID area, particularly in Europe, and then kind of wrapping it up by looking at the future of food banks and some kind of lessons and questions for us. So as I already mentioned, um, you know, the globalization of food banking, this whole project, this book is really based on what I'm saying is 15 years of in-depth field work um, across many different continents. But as I told you, you know, my interest in food banks started in Cincinnati when I was volunteering for a uh, food bank. And then after I finished my undergraduate Illinois, I was, I said earlier that I um, was looking at gaps in the, in the food bank network. And then over the years, you know, been kind of tracing the food banking um, process, uh, most recently in, in the global south. Um, you know, why I think food banking is important is for a couple of reasons. One, as you see in the map here, it's it's everywhere. It's often being touted as a key solution uh, to reduce fo uh, food insecurity, um, to promote uh, climate initiatives and environmental um, initiatives, and to... Uh, make uh, systems more efficient economically, which some call kind of the triple bottom line of the social, um, economic, and environmental. Um, it's often viewed as a solution because it's market-driven in the sense that it takes excess surplus food from corporates and government and gives them to food banks to, to households uh, through their, their network, though. So food banks don't give food directly to households, but they work through their network there. Um, also important because of this convergence of interests. There's a little something in here for everyone. F people like food banks and communities for uh, often for moral reasons. Companies love it because it um, is good for their brand and governments love it often because it kind of shifts sort of the attention away from what they're not doing. In addition to all that, uh, food banks are often v really viewed as an urban intervention. They work best in cities and they're very much like a lot of charity these days, connected to what I would say the philanthropic, you know, NGO corporate uh, partnership. So there's a lot of reasons why food banking um, has been on the agenda, um, both 
when we look at where it's expanding, but the sort of uh, different institutions that are promoting it. And so I've been tracing that um, all these years. Um, what we could say today, though, is that food banking is no longer a temporary institution. It's fully institutionalized. It is now, I don't know if many of you know this, the largest charity in the United States is Feeding America. In the COVID era, it went from third place. Now it's it's number one. Um, in the 1960s, uh, food banking started in Arizona. And in the 70s and 80s, um, when there was economic recessions and uh, sort of state pullback of government food programs, food banks started to expand. And it was really in the 90s and in the 21st century where food banks have now become institutionalized. They're in all major metropolitan areas, 200 uh, food bank networks across the United States, um, connected to 60,000 local beneficiary agencies. So again, what the food bank is, is it's this picture here. It's the, um, and this is the Greater Chicago Food Depository, but it's looking like this. It's a large warehouse. It's the, the kind of middle place where the donations are stored and then the, the surplus food and then given to the local community beneficiary organizations like the food pantries and the soup kitchens. So the food bank is the centralized uh, warehouse. I know many of you are probably interested in where food banks are, and I, I showed you that map, which you can you can see on, on the Global Food Banking Network website, but also made a table here, which is in the book, and it shows that food banks are everywhere. They're on all continents, the six continents, and they're um, primarily part of three big networks, which I'm going to go over going to go over now. The first biggest and most well known is the Global Food Banking Network. This is the GFN. It's headquartered in Chicago, which is not coincidental. It is a spin-off organization of Feeding America. So as I said, this large food banking network that started in the 60s in the U.S. and expanded in 2006, that's when this great international interest in food banking turned into the spin-off of the GFN. So the GFN looks outward across the globe. It now operates in 47 countries and six continents. It's primarily funded by wealthy individuals and importantly, large food corporations, Cargill, General Mills, Kellogg, for example. Um, it does provide training and it certifies food banks. So that's uh, very important as part of its model. Um, here's a graphic that kind of kind of looks at, you know, what the, the food mo banking model is according to the GFN. It's a very similar model to, to Feeding America. But again, this, this model, what the GFN does is it really um, facilitates, it streamlines the uh, food donations from the corporate sector in particular, but also government, um, and then connects it to these food bank warehouses in these different countries, um, and then goes to the local beneficiaries. And as I already mentioned, you know, part of this is this um, market-oriented um, solution towards um, repurposing uh, surplus food. A second important food banking network is FIBA, the European Food Banks Federation. It was in Paris, now it's in Brussels. It operates across the continent. And what's interesting here is that food banks operate in many places where there's a large social welfare state. So it's, it's operating in um, Western Europe, Eastern Europe, Southern Europe, and Northern Europe across the, the continent. And FIBA really works to uh, streamline those um, corporate relationships. And, you know, in, in Europe, there has been, depending on the context, because it's not the same everywhere, um, there has been some pullback of welfare support. There has been um, economic instability in different regions. There have been increased demand due to uh, e different flows of refugees that have come through and pushing for corporate green uh, branding in different places. So there's a number of different reasons why food banks have expanded. And we'll talk later about the role of COVID. So here is the model. Um, again, you know, you're looking at um, the EU being a major player here. So this is a very um, strategic um, initiative where, like the GFN, FIBA is, is working very strategically with big, important institutions. I didn't mention before, but the GFN is looking at connecting with the United Nations and making sure food banking is, is a key part of what they do. FIBA making sure that they're really connected with, with the EU. 
third big network is the FBRN, Food Banking Regional Network, and this is out of Dubai. Um, it operates um, in South Asia and across Sub-Saharan Africa. But um, if you speak with uh, the folks who run the FBRN, they'll tell you, and it says on their website, that the origins of the network and the sort of core region as they define it is the Arab region. And so um, while they're headquartered in Dubai, the origins of FBRN actually originated out of Egypt and, and is kind of spread across the continent um, or the region since it's a multiple continents. Um, even though it says there's 39 food banks across Asia and Africa, unlike the GFN, FBRN um, really kind of takes more of a hands-off approach. So they've helped start food banks, um, but the they don't train and certify food banks in the same way as GFN does. And so the development of food banks in a lot of these different contexts is uneven. Um, also, these food banks are located in, in many autocratic contexts. Um, that have maybe no social welfare state or maybe, um, you know, a, a state that's unstable. And so this is a very different context from um, where FIBA and, and GFN operates. FBRN um, works with these five different pillars um, to promote what they do. Okay. So that's the three big networks, GFN, FIBA, and the FBRN. I want to now talk a little bit about a couple of case studies that I think are really interesting and would be interested to see what you all think. The first one is called Food Forward South Africa and used to be called Food Bank South Africa. This is a very important pilot project for the GFN. And in fact, they will tell you, and it says in, in many of their writings and reports, that South Africa was chosen by the GFN as one of their first um, food bank uh, projects in the global south and it was chosen because of a few factors and this tells us a lot about um, how the gfn thinks about food banks they see it as a place that has a high poverty rate and inequality rate so the food insecurity need is high it has a large social grant system uh, one of the largest in in the global south it has a relatively stable government um, and um, very strong corporate sector and that's really important and so what folks did from the GFN is they went to high level government ministers when they were trying to develop this network. And they also connected with a lot of the large food corporations, which are there, which of course is key to the development of a food bank. Because one thing that we will, will note here is that food banks often work best in places where there's the greatest excess. And so if there's places with large um, food corporations, um, there's a lot of waste. And so food banks can operate better there. But what we've seen over the years, um, since I uh, first went to South Africa in 2007, yes, food banks have developed in the major cities um, and in the um, starting a little bit in the rural areas, although it struggled a little bit. What we've seen is a really big ups and downs. Um, there's been significant capacity and funding issues. Um, there's been already existing NGOs, which have run into sort of friction with the development of the food bank. And overall, even though the food bank sort of expanded its reach during the COVID era, its impact overall is still relatively small. And a part of the challenge here is that the food bank, while it had a very strong connection with government, has really pulled away from government uh, due to corruption and, and different sort of uh, perspectives and priorities. And so now the food bank is really, really dependent on, on fundraising. Another place where we've seen uh, food banking um, develop, um, interestingly, is a place that's had one of the highest food insecurity rates in the world. Um, India, in addition to being known for having um, high food insecurity rates, um, also has, compared to South Africa, a social welfare state, but it's not as developed uh, proportionally speaking. The food banking network there was de designed to capture corporate food waste, um, the food banking network, uh, the IFBN, is actually one of three different food banking networks that's developed there. Um, and they've tried to connect with um, some of the school feeding programs that have expanded. But interestingly, um, and the GFM will tell you this, they've run into major challenges developing food banks in India. And so you have to ask why, what, what's going on here? Well, there's a few reasons. One is that the food system structure is very different than it is in the US. 
more people are getting food in in a fresh uh, fresh food daily. There's less packaged food. Um, there is also more challenges logistically getting from point A to point B. If you've ever been to India, you know it can be very difficult with the the layout and the and the way that this the system the food system in the cities are developed. Um, like in South Africa, food banks um, are really most well developed for places where there's a strong formal food sector. And so if the informal food economy is a strong factor, like it is in India and South Africa, and much of the global South, food banks struggle. There's also multiple charities operating in this food insecurity space. And so from the government's standpoint in India, um, the food banking operation is relatively small. And so the government really hasn't really jumped on board. And so one thing we've seen both in India and South Africa is um, not is not really significant support from government. Corporate sector, probably stronger connection in South Africa than in India, in part because it doesn't see itself as having a role as much in India. But for different reasons, um, the food banks have been underdeveloped. And I think this is really important when the food bank is really, the GFN in particular, but all these networks are pushing the food bank out as a, as a big solution to food waste and food insecurity in, in places like India and South Africa across the global South, yet they've kind of struggled to, to keep and get, gain traction. Okay, so that's the first part of this of the talk today. And, and that's really more of, as I see it, the overview, right? Of those three big networks and how they've expanded globally. You know, one interesting thing here is that um, I was working on my book and I'm thinking, oh, I'm just about done. And then COVID happens. And I think, oh, great. Now my research is ruined. When in fact, what actually what happened is that um, the COVID era over the last few years um, has become a key part of the research. Food banks, um, really in many ways, the COVID era has been a kind of a turning point, a key time uh, where food insecurity and, and food waste in the food system in general across the globe has been kind of put into um, a tailspin and kind of flipped on its head. Some things that we probably already know, but just to highlight, um, food insecurity rates during COVID double from about 800 million to 1.6 billion. Um, while there were strong stimulus packages to support food and income uh, programs in many countries in the global North, US, for example, and across Europe, in the global South, that was less the case. And in those places, food insecurity has uh, persisted uh, and will probably continue to persist. Where in the global North and places like the US, because of the large support from government for food and income programs, uh, statistics have shown that uh, food insecurity has not been as high as been expected. And that's been a very interesting dynamic. So it shows the role of government in uh, promoting food insecurity, food security rather. We know that during this crisis of COVID, um, other disruptions in food systems, right? Increases in food prices, um, limited food access, uh, disruptions in, in, in the supply chains, which relates to food waste. Um, what happened with food waste? Uh, we had challenges that we all experienced, went to the grocery and there was no food on the shelves at the same time that there was food being plowed over in fields. And so we had these contradictions and there were some you know, policies to try to mitigate it. But ultimately what we found is that during the um, COVID era, you know, this food insecurity, food waste contradictions, right, were kind of pushed out to the forefront in, in many ways because we saw the um, global food system sort of fall apart, right? And so we've food banks were kind of centered right into that mix. So to look at this a little bit more detail, um, I want to talk a little bit about what happened in Europe. Um, what we had in Europe was what happened in a lot of places. And, and you all know this, you saw this in the news, we experienced it, food um, a demand increased rapidly during those months from, you know, March of to June 2020. The food bank and its network of agencies, you know, the food pantries and shelters really struggled to get people the, the help that they needed. Um, you can see in these statistics, and I can tell you that the FIBA network, part of the reason I looked at it is they did a fantastic job staying in touch with their food bank members um, to see how they were doing during COVID. And they have uh, about four or five reports on their website that sort of um, 
kind of showcase these statistics and, and how um, the different food banks um, operated. Some of the things that food banks needed that they didn't have. Well, one thing that Mina and I were talking about before uh, this talk started was uh, the, the real central role of volunteers in food banks, like a lot of the charity sector. And I remember going to uh, the Netherlands and folks talking about in a very you know positive way why having a lot of volunteers and no paid staff was a good thing. Well, of course, during COVID, given that many of these volunteers were over 65, this became a big vulnerability. So the volunteers, the staff kind of evaporated, connected to this. Of course, many food banks and their network agencies didn't have protective devices. Why would they? They, they never really thought about you know, some viruses as widespread as COVID. They had to somehow figure out how to get food to people. And so what they needed were um, you know, more boxes, more vehicles to get food to people, but through these you know, different means. And they didn't have the resources or the, or the uh, resources to do that. And so what happened is with without the funding or the needs, um, we saw um, closure of um, organizations. So uh, we saw rapid increases in demand, um, higher operational costs, yet at the same time, less food. So we had less food, but more cost. Disruptions in food donations, as we were talking about earlier, where food was not coming, right? Why would it? You know, these food retailers could barely get food on the shelves. They're not going to be donating it as much anymore. And I already mentioned here about the decreases in volunteers and, and the safety equipment. So this led to about 10 up to 50% of food banks and their member um, agencies closed during this critical period of March through the summer of about June 2020. So those are those critical months. Yes, food banks became more visible. We read about them in the newspaper as key frontline institutions, but they were arguably not really in a position to really push out what they wanted to do to help. And this was a this was really a, a, a key problem. So if we look at a couple of food bank networks in particular here, um, one was, as I was mentioning earlier, was in the Netherlands. Um, when I went to the Netherlands before COVID, you know, um, you know, Netherlands very well known for having a, a pretty low-ish poverty rate, well-developed social welfare uh, state. So the food bank network there was really to design to sort of fill the gaps. It wasn't to replace the social welfare state, but to fill the gaps. Um, you know, it had challenges like many food banks have had with, you know, the nutrition question and, and the stigma that some clients felt. But as I mentioned before, one of the things that folks had said to me who worked there, they said, um, we don't have any paid staff. And that was, a, that was sort of a point of pride, right? And that became, as I mentioned in the COVID time, a, a big challenge as the network became stretched, many closures, the overdependence on volunteers. Um, and in many ways, this the food bank network in the Netherlands is still trying to gain its footing. This varies uh, quite, it's very different experience in a different place, uh, corner of Europe, and that's in Norway. Many people say, why would you, why is there a food bank in Norway? Norway has one of the lowest poverty rates in the world. And that is true. Um, and interestingly, not surprisingly, the food bank network was very small in Norway. Um, it was designed to sort of fill in the small gap um, for corporate food waste that was otherwise wasted. It was mostly volunteer managed. But as I said, it really didn't gain much visibility or support because people didn't see a need for it. And interestingly, um, the the food bank network in Norway actually is in a much stronger position now because of COVID. And they will they'll tell you that um, the demand for food aid stretched in in uh, the country of Norway. But what it did is it led to the increased visibility of what they were doing. And so the president of FIBA um, had one said, you know, during COVID uh, to folks in Norway, we didn't really understand why there was a food bank in Norway. And then um, during COVID, we saw the value of what you were doing. And so this wasn't just in Norway, but it was across the continent where they saw a great uh, need for this kind of work. So increased visibility led to more dollars, led, led the food bank into a stronger position. A third food bank network that's different in the Southeastern context of Europe is in Greece. Um, a much higher poverty rate proportionally compared to um, what we saw in Netherlands and Norway, uh, moderately developed social welfare state, kind of 
develop uh, to fill in gaps in the social welfare state and and to you know mitigate corporate food waste. Um, but unlike you know other contexts and something that we have seen in um, a lot of Eastern Europe and post communist states and places like Greece is that there's a lot of tension between um, what the food banks as a viewed as a Western NGO is doing um, and taking sort of the um, making the the state look bad. And so the state often, the government is often not in a position to support the food banking network, interestingly, because they see it as um, taking away the, you know, and, and highlighting uh, what the, the government doesn't do. And this was only exacerbated during COVID. Um, we saw increases in demand. Um, we saw hostility from government increase and the capacity for the food bank there in Greece to fundraise. And so it's in a much weaker position. And so in many ways, different situations, different um, sort of results for food banks across the continent. Um, and this is kind of what we're seeing globally. We're seeing some food banks thrive because of COVID and some really struggle. So many of you probably ask, you know, well, what do we make of all this research? Where can we take all this? And so I, I want to kind of move towards, you know, wrapping this up and, and thinking about where we can go from here. I think a lot of this suggests that we have to remember that the food bank networks are fragile, really a vulnerable patchwork of food relief. Um, importantly, um, yes, food banks talk a lot about their the, rac the record numbers of um, people that they serve and food that's saved. Um, but what's interesting is that um, when it comes to food insecurity and food waste, the research shows that the impacts are unclear. In terms of food insecurity, there's a lot of other variables in play here. Um, people, um, you know, may be food insecure because of poverty, livable wages, other costs related to housing, health care. Um, and it's hard to really isolate the role that food banks have played because the economy, um, uh, government interventions, all these things are at play, you know, when we're thinking about what role can food banks play. Related to food waste, uh, research has shown about one to 3% of food is uh, saved by food banks. So in some ways it's a, a bit small. Um, I've already mentioned that the role of government during COVID was really important. Um, and, um, you know, what we're really trying to think about here is what role food banks can play in the post COVID world. Some of the critiques that have been put forth by others um, that, you know, I kind of explored in my research. One is that food banks, and you maybe have already heard this, other folks have talked about the food banks maybe kind of help the state and corporations. They help the state or government by sort of shifting attention away from what they what governments don't do. And so they'd help to depoliticize hunger. Um, food banks have been critiqued by, um, you know, helping corporations that um, kind of greenwash um, in a sense because the, the food industry can help focus on food waste and food insecurity as technical problems to be fixed in the marketplace rather than um, something that might be more structural. And I'd already mentioned here about the small impacts on food waste and food insecurity. So there's a number of questions that we're left with, right? A lot of this has to do with what are the impacts of food banks um, what role should they play, particularly in the global South? Um, and here are six things that I think kind of takeaways uh, that I want to kind of leave you with today and are, you know, takeaways, I think, in the book as well. Firstly, we really need to think about food insecurity and food waste as two separate issues. Food waste, if we repurpose surplus food, is not going to be sufficient or really deal with the causes as to why people are food insecure. People are food insecure because of poverty, because of their limited ability to buy food in the in the in the market, if it's the formal or informal market. Food waste is caused by um, inefficiencies in the global food system. So again, I think we have to think about those as two separate issues. I do think that food banks can play a small niche role in certain contexts, um, but they're not going to thrive everywhere. The role of government, as I said, is critical here. Um, food waste and food insecurity can't be really solved by food banks. They can be a small part of the solution, but it really has to be governments that have to continue to support food and income programs, promote the right to food as a basic human right. 
Corporations, I'm looking at number four here, have to pay livable wages. They also have to get out of the daily operations of food banks. They're on the board of many food banks, which has helped food banks get donations and help them become a political, but it also has limited food banks' ability to navigate and push for important issues like, um, you know, relating to the living wages and the like. Number five here, um, it's important food banks aren't just thought of and operate as another institution coming from wealthier countries to the global south to you know spread the solution right they have to work in local contexts and integrate the knowledge and experiences of food banks in local contexts why are food banks struggling in south africa and india what lessons can we learn there and then number six here again recognizing that if food banks are going to play a small role they may not work in places where there really is the greatest food insecurity challenges. And I know that's where a lot of folks in the GFN and other networks want to push out, but informal economies, rural areas, and the global South more generally are very challenging contexts because food banks work best when they're in cities, when they're in places with a stronger formal uh, food uh, you know, vendors. And uh, they, they really can be challenged in these other contexts. And even in where they are successful, they still may play a smaller role. And like I said at the beginning of the talk, you know, this was something I thought would just be a few years, but here I am continuing after the book, still looking at food banks as they expand. Later this year, I'll be in uh, different parts of Europe and in um, Africa in places like Uganda, Ethiopia, Kenya. Um, the food banking um, you know, model has continued to expand. And I think it's really critical that we try to understand um, its implications. So I wanna thank you all for listening. Uh, my contact details there at the bottom and I look forward to our conversation. So thanks very much. Thank you, Dan, that was really fascinating. I mean, this whole thing is fascinating to me because I think that um, we don't understand this whole chain because you would something one one of the things that you had said very very early on maybe even before we started was that food insecurity is um it starts and it ha there's lo lots of entry points for it mm -hmm. and um so it's there's just so many aspects um yeah. so just really quick somebody asked at the very beginning and i didn't want to interrupt you but could you just give a quick um a definition of a food bank yeah, and absolutely. I appreciate that question because it really is central um, to um, understanding how this particular phenomenon is unique. And so it's really these warehouses where um, the food that's donated is stored, um, sort of um, organized, reorganized, and then uh, delivered to organizations. So food banks do not give food to people. They give food to organizations they give it to people. So if you have, let's say an example like Walmart or Kroger, they'll donate their food to a food bank warehouse that then will, will donate food to, you know, like a local church pantry that gives it to people. And that's where this warehouse has definitely streamlined food donations. There's no question about it. Um, but with it um, has been some of the challenges that, you know, that we've been talking about. And so it may, um, help streamline those corporate food donations, which potentially have gone to different players. Um, but um, it's not going to be, in the, it's not going to be, I would argue, capable of meeting the great needs to overcome food insecure and food waste. It probably can, you know, play a, a smaller role. But thanks for that question. No, oh, interesting. Um, Cindy asks, what, how does Harry Chapin's why hunger fit into this picture? Yeah, I mean, um, boy, you know, it, it's a that's that's been part of the inspiration for this work is to try to think about, um, you know, the leading food scholars. I don't know if, if that person had a, a more specific question, but I can just say that this is, um, you know, a lot of the the work around not just food banks, but trying to understand more the community food movements and how we can organize and advocate for um food justice, food access um, in a way that can maybe contest some of these um, reorganization of the global food system. Because that's a lot about what's talked about, I think, in that work and in other works is how we can have more of a, a bottom-up approach. Mm -hmm. Thanks.
Um, well, before I go on to other questions, what is your sense of the cultural mm -hmm. um, perspectives on hunger in in the, on the global sense? Like some some countries are obviously much more supportive of feeding their hungry, some not so much. Yeah, I mean, that's a very big question. I think many different ways to answer it. I mean, food systems, firstly, are organized differently. And that's an economic question, but it's also a cultural question. You know, how people access food, how people share food, um, redistribute food. It's not just in this corporate top-down sense. People in very important ways will, um, you know, go from rural areas to urban areas and back and forth. They'll be sharing food um, uh, within large families, extended families, communities, and gifting of food. And this is relates to, of course, religious perspectives, different cultural perspectives and relationships with food. And so I think that's very important. And so that's part of the reason that food banks can't do everything. They can only do some. Um, you know, I also think, um, you know, when you're talking about, um, you know, cultural understandings of food, we have to, um, I think really importantly, see that food um, systems are going to, are going to differ from, you know, where the origins are. And I think that's part of the reason it's been challenged is that food banks, they come from the United States. Um, and there's been a lot of critiques that, you know, food banks, is this just another sort of, uh, Western Northern sort of approach to doing development in a context, um, or maybe it just won't fit. And I think that's one of the big questions. And so very much, you could also look at these food bank questions in a developmental context, in a, in a cultural context, um, because I think, you know, we all, everyone in this webinar tonight has a different relationship with food and, and thinks about food differently and and as many ways uh, shaped by the, the kind of experiences that we have. Mm -hmm. I was thinking more too about the sort of um, feeling of shame if you mm. have to go to a food bank. Um, that came up a lot during COVID, people that had never had to go to a food bank or a food pantry. Um, but I'm going to go on to some other questions because we have a bunch of them. Um, okay. Elliot says, and this is from the very beginning of your presentation, Dan, towards the beginning of your talk, you mentioned that food banks are popular because food banks are a market oriented solution to do something. Do you remember what that what that sentence was? Market oriented solution sure. to something. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's a great point. Um, you know, I think that um I just want to, before I forget, Mina, I think your comment about the um, the stigma is a key one, and I think is really important. Um, and, and a part of what's going on there is is it's critical to have this understanding of different cultures and not be. That's part of the thing that I didn't mention, but in South Africa, um, one of the challenges that folks ran into was this tension, as you can imagine, where you know race and class kind of intersect um, and really. Um, troubling ways and some of the food bank folks didn't really understand that initially and that was that was one of the challenges um the question um around market yes this is absolutely true you know if you if you the oftentimes a lot of the more successful food banks have stronger connections with corporations and the corporations are defining the the problem that that we're talking about here as something that can really be fixed by just having um, a better functioning market mechanism. And so some have called food banks an extension of, food, of corporations or reverse logistics. Um, and even interestingly, I've had government ministers who I've met with offhand say, yeah, you know, this food bank network is just, it's just an extension of the companies. Um, they're, these food banks are, are operating here and that they're doing work for free that the companies don't want to do themselves. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, I'm, you know, it's up to us to decide if, that kind of criticism is is reasonable or not. But I do think that um, a lot of the most important players have strategically kind of placed the food bank network in these three networks that I've talked about at the, you know, the uh, GFN, FIBA and the FBRN squarely in this in this uh, line of being um, technical solutions. Right. So this is where they kind of can fit in within um, the market, right, an extension of, of companies. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, Andrew asks, are food banks, do they often collaborate with other food waste outlets such as mm. composters, digesters, et cetera? Yeah, no, another great question. And it will vary by context. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the food banks, for example, in the U.S., there's 200 uh, food banks, um, 60,000 beneficiary organizations. But food banks have their own 
Um, not every food bank is part of Feeding America, although it's the largest network. Some organizations choose not to be part of Feeding America because they want to do things their own way. Um, you have certain rules and regulations when you take government commodities through Feeding America and through the, um, the you know, ways that you um, store and redistribute food and some of the rules that apply. Um, interestingly, about what was just asked, um, one of the projects that I looked at that was in Cincinnati, where Kroger is headquartered, is they were connecting with an organization in Boston around these um, aerobic uh, digester um, to create energy out of some food waste. And so this is an example where, um, you know, the company, the food company is using the food bank in some ways to, um, you know, market new um, green initiatives. And this is where I was saying, you know, is it valid to say that it's greenwashing or not? Again, it's up to you to decide. But if you look at some of the sustainability reports that are put out by companies like Kroger, for example, you'll see that they promote um, record amounts of food donated and repurposing of food waste for things like alternative energy. So the question there is, while that in itself isn't a bad thing, um, is that a small project? Is it a big project? Is it deflecting attention potentially away from where, you know, a Kroger might be most influential, right? Where Kroger, the largest food retailer in the United States, has major influence on food prices, um, the wages that it pays, et cetera. And so there's this tension um, between some of those projects that it does and some of the other activities. Again, I can tell you in Ohio, Kroger is pushing out its um, green initiatives and its record amounts of donations, but it's also closing stores across um, inner city neighborhoods in um much of it's uh, in Ohio and, and, and beyond. And so there's this tension between, you know, some of the work that they're doing. And so that's just to give you an example and in many other institutions, right, where food banks tell a story much bigger than just of themselves. They tell you a lot about what government is or isn't doing, what corporations are or aren't doing. And so it's really a lens into um, the food system and a, and a hook much into really society more generally. Mm -hmm. Um, this question from Beth actually uh, relates to what you were just saying, that the fact that food corporations are involved in distributing surplus food is mind boggling. To what degree do you see them as part of the issue, which you kind of answered? And do, you, do they get tax benefits for these donations? Right, right. And that's a great question. There's a lot of benefits for food companies to do this, this kind of work. Um, the publicity that companies are getting because there's a lot of pressure on companies to show that there have great initiatives, um, that they're sustainable. And so our challenge is to sort of, you know, look below and in more depth at kind of the kind of work that they're doing. And the challenge that I found is that it was hard to really look to see, well, you know, companies like Kroger say that they, they reduce, um, they waste less and less food over the years. And that's great. But how do I know? Because of course the the data is, is going to be competitive data. No company is going to give you data to show you what they're you know wasting or not because it's it it's about you know in the competitive market. Anyone who knows anything about um, in the grocery industry, it's a very tight margins, and so any slight advantage can make a big difference between expanding and closing. Mm -hmm. And so they're they're much more tight lipped about that. And so there's a lot of benefits um, to you know, promoting the food donations and um, for emphasizing what they're doing in communities to reduce food insecurity and in food waste. And so again, the food bank sits at this place where corporations and governments in some contexts can really push out how they're impacting the triple bottom line related to sustainability and can say that they are, you know, doing the good work. And our challenge here is to figure out not if something's bad or good, but to get into the details of to figure out, you know, what are the different motivations here um, behind these, these institutions? Um, because we have to remain focused on, uh, I would argue the power institutions, mm -hmm. governments and corporations as as much these, you know, in the big scheme of things, smaller NGOs like the food banks, they're large, but compared to these other institutions, they're actually kind of small. Mm -hmm. um this is an interesting question on a more local basis. How do we find out if we want to find out what corporations or organizations are not donating to food banks um, and, yeah. how, and how can we push them to do so? 
Right. And that's an interesting question. Um, I remember for a long time, Meyer wasn't donating and then they had change in leadership and then instantaneously they, they, they had a, a big push and are one, a very big donator of food. Mm -hmm. So a lot of it um, will come down to management and have to be convinced of the value of donating food. Because what's interesting is in the U.S., um, Feeding America is so institutionalized. And you see billboards across the United States, one in seven people are hungry, et cetera. Um, and, you know, food banks have strategically positioned themselves not to be political. So you have people across the political spectrum, right, which has been a mixed bag because it also limits, again, their ability to, I think, push for different initiatives, but has allowed them to grow. Um you know, um, other institutions have, um, you know, some food banks, like I said earlier, have decided not to become part of Feeding America um, and have not donated food. Um, you really could often ask, um, you know, and look at a lot of their um, annual reports to see if they, because they'll usually be promoting um, the the kind of, you know, their donations. But just because they don't donate food to Feeding America doesn't mean they're not doing good work. Maybe they have connections with smaller organizations and some have chosen to continue those historical legacies. So there's a lot of reasons why um, you might see um, mixed perspectives. But I really like the, this question because it, it really asks us to be engaged and to um, push on institutions. These days, um, corporations... Um, should have something out there in the public sphere about what they do related to this kind of work. And so if you can't find it, that probably says something and they probably have a sustainability officer that should be able to answer or point you to the right direction. Mm -hmm. um, Valerie says, and I, this is an interesting question as well about um, perishable foods and yeah. food banks, are they, are they good with this? Are they not good with this? Are food banks the right place to handle perishable foods? Um, right. what discuss. <laughs> yeah, another great question. So, um, you know, what's, what's important here is a lot of people who work at food banks are actually aware of a lot of the challenges that I'm talking about and are very much advocates for a lot of um, things that we all are, are for. And so, you know, what food banks have tried to do is make changes where they can. One area they've tried to push a lot is on nutrition. Because, of course, the, one of the oldest critiques of food banks is, you know, you have a pallet of Liptonite iced tea combined with um, lobster combined with, you know, like you just pick the most random foods mm -hmm. and there you go. Right. And so it's whatever comes through that that week. And there's often limited capacity for the healthier foods, you know, fruits and vegetables and other things that might be perishable. So what more and more food banks have done, because there's been those critiques, is they um, have increased their capacity as they've gotten more funding to have greater storage capacity. But they often will offset with um, purchasing food to make sure that the balance is better. It varies dramatically by food bank system. But um, when I was interviewing folks in Chicago, um, you know, in 2000 and let's see, five, versus a couple of years ago, and so this is like 15 years later, over the years as I've tracked them, there's been a huge sea change over there. And that's because they are very aware, um, the CEO over there, for example, of these kinds of issues. And so there's been a real push to kind of ex expand and increase um, fresh produce, but it really comes down to the capacity of the food bank um, in terms of storage, in terms of um the fundraising and, and dollars and sense that they're going to be willing to, to spend money on it. So it, it really varies. It's an area I think that there of growth and, and, and can continue to improve, but has improved somewhat. Mm -hmm. um, Anne-Marie asked a question. I'm not completely sure what, what she's asking, but she says, are you looking into bridging any of the gaps between what the food banks receive and distribute? <laughs> um. Well, that maybe in some ways that overlaps kind of what we were just talking about, um, which is that you're right. There is um, one of the oldest critiques of food banks is that what they receive is just whatever government commodity over, you know, leftovers or Kroger or Walmart or Meyer doesn't need anymore. And how do you then repurpose that to, um, you know, local communities? And so that's where the food bank has to step up and offset that with, you know, the fresh produce and the like and make it a much more well-rounded but, you know, we're dealing with, if you look at this issue globally, food banks 
outside of the US and Europe, for example, in many ways are, are still in process and they don't have the capacity to really do that. So if you go to South Africa, go to India, you know, it's still a work in progress. And so that's part of the reason that the food banks haven't really gained as much traction is because they, you know, people look at them and think, well, this isn't, what is this really doing, you know, for us and, and making big impacts to reduce food insecurity. And so, you know, again, it, we have these contradictions where we have great food waste, high amounts of food waste, and that food waste, if we're calling it that, and that surplus food isn't always the kind of food that is needed in communities. And so I think that that disconnect is always going to be a central challenge for food banks. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And like everything else, people sort of expect them to do everything for everyone. Right. You know, now they're doing diapers and mm -hmm. toothbrushes and things as well, you know, feminine products. Mm -hmm. um, it's tough, um, especially as a volunteer organization. Although I did want to say um, before I ask the last question is, um, you know, you had mentioned South Africa and India, and mm -hmm. I had mentioned to you earlier that I'm Indian. And it, to me, it seems like there's a, a scale issue there because India right. is such a huge population and um and Africa, many parts of or some parts of Africa had been in war for or like having civil wars and things like this. So there's mm -hmm. different aspects going on in these different places that affect this, right? Absolutely. And so um, before I forget, the first part of what you had just mentioned about um, um, you were just mentioning before the India part about um, um, scale. Do you remember what you were asking? What was that what you were asking there? Um, you said something before the question. I was gonna. Okay. Oh, that they the food banks are doing a little of everything. Yes. yes. And so again in Cincinnati, you know, they have this really re well renowned kind of one stop center that's doing food and it's doing all these other basic services. And so I kind of worry because you know what is what is the purpose of that? Is that to replace maybe what government should be doing a centralized role, or is it okay to have a hub where they can do all these services? So that's really another question for us: is should we have a, a narrow mission that we can maybe do more effectively, which is really repurpose surplus food and call it a day and say that maybe government, you know, and other institutions should do the other work, or should they have an expanded, you know, uh, set of things that they do. And that relates to the, the question that you just asked, which was around scale. And so in India, what was always mentioned to me is that these NGOs just simply don't have the capacity. It's government who has the capacity. The school feeding program, any program that they develop immediately has an enormous impact because they're the only ones who have the scale to implement something that large. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, where does that put an NGO? I mean, South Africa is not a small country. Of course, it's significantly smaller than India. In many parts of Africa, what's interesting, if any of you go on the GFN website, you'll see that they're expanding to Kenya, Ethiopia, um, they're the DRC, uh, Botswana, um, Nigeria, other places. And so this question about what is the role of government? What's the relationship between the th types of things that food banks do and um, what the government does? And so you can't really separate it because, you know, maybe this the story in India will be that food banks have a role to play to mitigate corporate food waste, but they're going to be a small piece. Um, but until government kind of jumps on and supports them in a significant way, if they do it all, or if they do that kind of service, you're not going to really see, I think, a big, a big impact. And so the big kind of, the big, you know, kind of question for us here is, you know, where do food banks work? Where should they work? Should the GFN be pushing out in, you know, all corners of sub-Saharan Africa, or should they focus more on South Africa and Nigeria and Kenya and places that might be a little bit stronger economically, that might have a little bit more stable governments. And that's a question, right? Because the food insecurity rates in some of the lower income countries is greater, but the capacity for the food bank to work well might be lower. So mm -hmm. that's the tough one. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's just so many variables. Um, yeah. The last question, which I think is a really good one. Um, what can we do locally to minimize food waste uh, ourselves? Um, mm -hmm. not just like going out and campaigning for people to not waste, but what can we do? Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's an important last question because it's easy to think, oh boy, these issues are so big. I can't do anything. And of course, that's the last thing I want us to be, you know, to leave, you know, a talk or a conversation like this tonight, because we can all do something. 
Um, of course, it's nice for us, you know, to advocate for certain, you know, uh, programs that we think are important that maybe your local, state, or federal government should be doing. You know, thinking critically about where you shop and about what corporations, you know, are doing related to food waste and food insecurity. But you could also be more household oriented. You know, how much food do you buy? Where you know, do you have a compost in the back? You know, what do you do when 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 your food is is not used? You know, kind of thinking more ahead about what you buy and when you buy. And so, um, you know, in a U.S. context, a lot of the food waste, I think about forty percent, depending on the study, is at the household level. So we still have a significant role that we can do to mitigate, you know, food waste. Um, it's connected though. You know, it's like you go to, a, who wants to go to a grocery store and buy a molded piece of fruit? Probably not. Maybe you'll buy an ugly fruit, you know, that's a B plus fruit and you could do something with it. And there's, you know, advocates for that, but we have to figure out how we can have um, everyone do their part. And that's us as individuals, companies, governments, NGOs, like food banks. I think we all have a role um, to play. And I think that we can push in other institutions, but we all can do something um, in our own household um, in terms of how we use and, and waste and reuse food. Thanks for the question. Yeah, I think it's important for us to feel hopeful that we can have some impact, even if it's not on a large scale. So um, thank you so much, Dan. This has been fascinating. And, um, and like I said, a bit hopeful. Good, good. No, I appreciate all the questions and and appreciate the opportunity to talk to everyone today. Um, you know, I have my email on the last slide. I'm I'm happy to talk with anyone um, offline who wants to talk a little bit more about about these issues. And I'm passionate about it, and I'm sure you are too. And that's why you're here. So, thanks to Mina and and for everyone joining tonight. I, I really appreciate it. Great. And I will be in touch with everybody uh, soon, and I will include Dan's email there so that you can contact him if you have any follow-up questions. So thank you. Have a wonderful night, and don't waste food. <laughs> <laughs> Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.